So first, I should probably uh, start by, by thanking you all for being here these days. Uh, that we're, we're all plagued in the news with the, the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, and so forth. Do we travel or not? And the, uh, interestingly here, I'm um, emeritus at Stanford. I taught there for many decades, still have an office. I'm recalled, so I occasionally teach. But I'm also CEO and chairman of Asia Inc., which is a company that that works in this space, and just to kind of, with this setting of the virus and that, one of the interesting things. At Stanford, I'm allowed to come here to this conference and represent, because it's in the same area. But if I go outside the country, any country in the world, and I come back, I have to stay out of my Stanford office for 14 days. Uh, I have to self-quarantine just for traveling outside the United States. My company's it's, it's based on six continents. We have business on six continents. We have to travel. We, we have needs and so forth. We can't let our precautions uh, prevent us, uh, you know, be, be worse than actually catching the disease, right? So um, I have to travel for that, so I'll have to serve my 14 days as far as my Stanford office is, is concerned. But let's start thinking, well, you know, maybe there'll be a, a solution to this that arises, vaccines or, or cures, but maybe not the next few years. And we're going to have to start thinking maybe about more virtual. This meeting, we're all fortunate to come together, but maybe that's not going to be the case. And we're going to have to use the internet and virtual uh, uh, things of various sorts uh, to do that. And so you have these, these different alternatives. Wi-Fi is out there. It is 80% of the data. You'll see a chart on that momentarily. 5G is out there. You'll notice I played here with the five. I wrote it out, and the first two letters are, are FI, of course, so Wi-Fi, 5G. Is it convergence, or is it going to be contention? I'm going to present something here today that I think will be important in the context of the data use of a path that leads more to a convergence of these technologies than to a contention between them. So let me go uh, here. I'm going to, this is just my outline, but I'm going to start uh, first bullet here. I'm looking at both of those technologies and some data about it, and then I'll, I'll progress to cloud management methods that could be, uh, could be used uh, uh, for this and the particular solutions and some standards that are ongoing. So this is the data that, uh, that Cisco releases every year, and the particular graph I took was from last year's survey, but it basically it breaks down the amount of data in the internet and how it is accessed, um, whether it's mobile, or, or fixed, uh, some kind of wired connection with Wi-Fi at the end of different types of devices. And I suspect this last column here just says fixed wired, but I suspect even you know, portion, a growing portion of that um, is, is being offloaded uh, to, to Wi-Fi. And if you add those together, in fact, indeed, it is 80% uh, there. Now think of what this chart might look like if we all had to stop going to conferences and and using video or video conferencing. And to get a better personal experience, uh, we go to one-to-one -to -one meetings basically to establish a better, um, a better feeling between the participants. How do we do it? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause this graph to jump up uh, even more in the future. If cures don't emerge, we may see a world that's increasingly virtualized simply uh, for practical reality. Um, cellular systems today tend to have big cells or larger cells than Wi-Fi systems, which tend to be smaller, okay? And that's part of the reason you see um, uh, much more of the data going there. It's free, but it's also a little faster, it's a little smaller, but it's very, very random in terms of its, um, uh, its distribution. So is 5G going to change this, or, or is it going to magnify it, would be the question. Some more data from that same, this, this time this year's data, but it gives you an idea on the number of devices and billions here, um, which types of devices are using the internet uh, uh, data itself. And you can see the projections on that. Interestingly here, last year there were 169 million Wi-Fi hotspots around the world. In 2023, they project 628 million Wi-Fi hotspots uh, around the world. So um, obviously growing. And interesting, most of this machine to machine, that's the biggest area, that's connected home. If you look in the, the survey, they will tell you that uh, about it. So the access of us uh, to the internet, whether we're trying to do the virtual meeting for work or just many of the other things that we use the internet for, um, that's growing. 
and a big concentration inside the home and, and, and use there. So cellular doesn't really service uh, as much of these, these things here. Of course, the smartphones, they do service. But often, we're on Wi-Fi for everything else. Uh, maybe a tablet may have a, uh, a service. Maybe some other things may have service. There are some narrowband LTE or other types of technologies emerging uh, that do attempt to address um, the other devices other than the cell phones. So that's where cell, uh, cellular is concentrated. And we're going to see, as, as that happens, they try to compete with that. Um, there's a number of very low power Wi-Fi uh, type systems that are starting to enter the marketplace, a number of different technologies for that. Uh, the objective here, of course, is use of batteries and preserving um, uh, the, uh, the use of the device as long as possible. Okay, so that kind of sets the setting uh, of, of where data needs are going and they may magnify. Um, and here I actually, um, from that same survey, pulled out the uh, kind of the 3, uh, 3G, 4G, and 5G. You can see the different colors here. And then what's plotted here vertically is the, the, the megabits per second and then um, uh, versus, of course, the year on the horizontal axis. You can see 5G um, really explodes a bit in terms of the potential bandwidth that's available. Um, I did the same thing. I just made this plot myself, but I went to the different Wi-Fi technologies. For, they're now called 4, 5, and 6, but basically 11 AG, AC, AX, and also plotted the data rates. They also have a similar uh, type of growth, although the data rates are higher uh, for Wi-Fi. A lot of this is using wire, wider bandwidths at higher frequencies that haven't been used before in the past. Some of it's using more antennas. Uh, the Wi-Fi is faster, um, clearly here, even than the best 5G speeds uh, at it peak, it, its peak speeds, but it's unregulated. Okay, and there's a lot of contention uh, that's causing this, a contention-based protocol. Uh, cellular does not use a contention-based protocol to resolve the use of the, the spectrum. So, um, so let's, let's investigate that a little bit more technically, okay, in terms of uh, what, what's happening. Uh, if you, I had just a plot here, and it's a little hard to read, but the horizontal axis is basically megahertz, and frequency is 20 megahertz wide. And then there's a, a dual path system. So this is a direct between the two communicating parties, and then there's a bounce off a wall or a bounce off of something that's 200 nanoseconds. That's a realistic number. And depending on whether those paths are adding in phase or they're adding out of phase, you'll get positive or negative reinforcements. So your, your frequency band looks like this uh, in terms of these good spots and bad spots uh, on that multipath system. So if you look at 2G first systems, that's the old GSM systems, they were only 300 kilohertz wide. And if you pick the wrong spot, you're not going to get much signal through, right? So you're going to have an outage. Your call's going to drop or whatever. 3G, you know, as, as advocated by, by Qualcomm, everybody knows this spread spectrum systems came into existence, and they were basically four times wider. And they have some codes in them. They're a little more robust. So no matter where you put the one megahertz, you're going to get a little bit of loss in the band, but the other part will get through. And so that improved things a bit. 4G. Um, went to multi-carry techniques, so the spread spectrum kind of uh, gave way to a better form of spread spectrum uh, that uh, is 20 megahertz wide. So now it's using codes in that to be yet even more robust uh, throughout the system. And 5G is, is off the charts here. It's much wider than 20 megahertz in terms of the spectrum uh, that it's, it, it's attempting to use. So you see this wider spectrum occurring. And then they try to carve it up into nice little blocks, and frequency and time and so forth. And this is how your cellular system will work, is allocating this to the different users uh, in a way that they're not using the same frequencies at the same time with one another. And then we layer multiple antennas on top of that. So I've shown here eight transmit antennas and eight receive antennas. And a system that's called MIMO, multiple input, multiple output. But it basically, it means something like this. And what they do is they carve up space, make it three-dimensional. And if those antennas are more than a half wavelength apart, and the higher up in frequency you go, the smaller the wavelength that you get. So these can be you know, on the order of centimeters apart and still be more than a half wavelength apart. It turns out you're carving up space, so you get now eight, eight more channels here, eight times the bandwidth by carving up space to different points 
Um, and so as that happens, it leads to this ability to go wider and wider. And then you can try to time schedule and spatially schedule uh, which user goes where uh, in the system. And that's what, that's what the cellular systems today are trying to do. And the number of channels can be up to the number of antennas used, basically. So you see the cellular systems here. Uh, they get this nice diagram um, uh, from a professor in Sweden, but everyone likes to use this thing. And I've shown cell phones here. It could be anything uh, out there they're connecting to. But beautifully centralized. Each one's got their own slot in space. They're using the same frequencies uh, or reusing uh, to do that. Uh, very nice, clean, and organized. Okay. Now, many of you this morning, if you did what I did, you came in here and you said, what's the Wi-Fi password? It was on the, the, the breakfast table, right? And you could turn in it. Anyone bother to count the number of Wi-Fi's that you saw? I, I did. It was like 45. They're all using the same spectrum. So you think about that. There's a contention protocol. So sometimes you go to a conference and the Wi-Fi doesn't work very well. Well, what's going on? There's too many people on it, right? And they're all fighting with one another. So this is very nice cellular and that. We've got to pay for that. It doesn't go through walls very well, so you have problems with using it inside systems inside of hotels like this. Here's the Wi-Fi system. It's a mess. Right? Everything's interfering with everything else. It's unregulated. Um, and so um, here we go. Maybe higher speeds. We all like to use it. 80% of the data is there. But it's not in great shape in terms of the contention protocols. So uh, what can we do about that? Well, so you, you say, well, and, and I've, I've actually read some major gurus in the the industry pr predicting that Wi-Fi will die and 5G will take over everything. But this, I'm, as you can probably tell from looking at me, I'm, I'm not a spring chicken anymore, so I've been around a while. And if you go back 20, 25 years, some of you may go back that far, you'll remember a major uh, fight between what was called ATM, asynchronous transfer mode, is a new packet switching technology that service providers, uh, telcos around the world, were promoting. Very nicely designed, centrally controlled, beautiful theories behind this thing, how you handle all the different packets. And there's constant bit rate and variable bit rate services that are being offered, promoted by these service providers who were huge companies uh, at that time. They're still big today. And they own all the switches. They control everything. They own the spectrum um, that might be used. And it's all managed and great. And so. Um, I'm going to compare that to today's cellular 5G is the point I'm making. It's all centrally controlled. It's basically the same groups that are controlling and owning that. Then you had this other thing come along called the Internet. You know, they, they started with the UCLA guys, uh, you know, and Vince Cerf and Lynn uh, Kleinrock and others working on trying to just, you know, talk to one another. And they got to come up with a different way of doing this. They had to put the control in their own hands to do that. So they came up with the TCP IP protocol, right? And basically, it grew, OK? And TCP IP was in a major fight with ATM, OK? And everyone thought TCP IP was going to lose eventually. But it had one thing going for it that the other guys didn't have. It put the control in the hands of the users. That's why we've got 80% on Wi-Fi today is because we have control of that. Or somebody who wants to provide an application to us or do a hot spot in a coffee shop or whatever, they have control of it. And so the analogy I would make is that this distributed TCP IP system, it uses the infrastructure, kind of like Wi-Fi uses the spectrum, but it's, it's today's Wi-Fi. So it's a mess too. But it's worked, and we all use it, and it's been driven some of the biggest companies in the world. We just heard from Microsoft, but we went on with Amazon, Netflix, Apple, Baidu, whoever it happens to be. These companies today dwarf the service providers. And a lot of that is due to this TCP IP protocol that enabled that to, to actually happen. OK, so that's the analogy I make. So we have a mess. The internet kind of got solved with kind of a cloud-based management system, so this is called router tables that get passed around, the spanning tree algorithms and so forth, to try to come up with a system that could deal with the, with the mess. So how do we do that for Wi-Fi uh, and 5G? Well, the, the big problem you have to deal with and why we saw 45 networks here uh, today, um, overlapping coverage. 
So you start with maybe one Wi-Fi network, and it's got some devices it's talking to. It would be great if it was in isolation. We could send some things to the cloud here, that LRM, as I'm going to call it, Learned Resource Manager. Okay? It's going to try to help. And it might be able to do some things to help uh, that uh, in terms of the performance of the system. Uh, so I'd call that a management interface and some kind of passage. But suppose we get a second overlapping AP. Same thing. Now they're starting to fight with one another. They're using the same spectrum. Third one, add even more difficulty. You've got 45. You'd have 45 of these clouds up here uh, all interfering with one. And put the AI there that tries to resolve the contention between the different uh, networks. And then feed into it quality of experience metrics. This is the users themselves, kind of like TCP IP, put the control in the hands of the user. What we want to do is actually make the users happy of this, this system. So let me talk about that here um, momentarily. But just to reinforce, seller centrally controlled, whatever our, our resources are, whether they're spectrum, it's time, it's space, somehow carving, they go in different places, the different users. Sharing is largely through any kind of mobile virtual network operation, so it's a paid arrangement between the owner of the spectrum and someone who wants to provide a service. There is some borrowing from adjacent cells, something called co coordinated multipoint that's used in the standards uh, to do that. Um, but they're now moving into the unlicensed spectrum. I, I heard Marty Cooper a few, he's the inventor of the cell phone. I, we were on a call together and we heard about what was called LTEU, unlicensed. And, and, and we'd never heard of it before. This is a few years ago. And he says, sounds like a land grab from the service providers into the Wi-Fi uh, arranged to basically take over. And in, in, in effect, it could be characterized that way. So you're going to see 3G, PP, 4G, 5G stuff starting to use the Wi-Fi bands as well. Uh, but the control channels are in the licensed. So uh, interesting. The contention-based protocols, these things coming together, they overlap. And if there's a collision, then they have to back off for a random period of try, a time and then try again. And hopefully it gets through uh, eventually by using that, that protocol. So uh, this contention is what causes the mess. Now, the Wi-Fi bands are, are much smaller, but 5G is trying to get to smaller bands and move uh, the edges closer to us all, uh, so to speak, in a network. Uh, so what can we do uh, about this, uh, basically, to, uh, to, to resolve this? So that's really the subject for today. Now, to try to understand, you've all been to cocktail parties. OK, right? And you're in there, and you're talking to people. There's these groups in the corner, and you're in that. So we have a couple of these groups here, and they're having conversations. And what happens is it's a little loud uh, because somebody's uh, talking next to you, so you, you got to get the person next to you to talk a little bit louder okay, so that you can hear them better. Okay? And then what happens, of course, is they start doing that. Then the first, first group, they have to talk louder, too, because they can't hear each other anymore. right? And then you, you get this, this, this effect that's called the cocktail party, basically, where everyone's shouting in the room, and nobody can hear anybody else. right? That's the mess. All right? So uh, what, what's happening here is, is counterproductive. The solution, you probably all guessed, you've been at cocktail parties. What happens is if you all talk a little softer, okay, everybody can have a productive conversation no matter where they are in the room. Okay? So they told me I actually had to switch sides to the other uh, here. As, as they could, so I'm going to move over here halfway through the talk and, and, and talk to this, this particular slide. But that's the solution. Everybody talks gently. Uh, softly, and you do better. And this is how the cloud-based solutions are kind of going to work. Okay? It's they're going to follow that cocktail party um, principle. And, but that isn't the way Wi-Fi works today, because there is no management like this. When you buy a box, they'll, they'll advertise very high speeds, 1 gigabit, 10 gigabits per second. Some of the, uh, some of the, the, the chip manufacturers in the Wi-Fi business are very proud of how fast they can go. And what they're doing is the cocktail party shouting with all their antennas at the highest possible power level and knocking everything out except for themselves. Now, they do that in, 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 a, in a laboratory situation. They quote you those data rates. So that's not really what's going to happen. But doing that 
in a crowded place is absolutely the worst thing you can do in terms of the contention between the different uh, systems. So how might you solve this? And so this is my proposed solution for it. I call it ergodic spectrum management, ESM. And there's a paper, if it just came out this, this month. It's an invited paper in the uh, IEEE Transactions on Communications. Um, and uh, happy to get more detail there. So I, I, mentioned, I mentioned quality of experience earlier versus quality of service. A lot of people use these two terms uh, interchangeably, but they're really not the same thing. Quality of experience has to do with the consumer and whether they're happy, if it's a thing, whether it's productive uh, or not. And it can be measured in terms of things of complaints, calls, chat bots, chat rooms with negative comments, mean opinion scores uh, on the quality of service, like buttons, and what's really important here is if you get a not like button where somebody's unhappy, uh, it's very useful. Churn, dropping the service, loss of eyeballs or, or canceling a subscription are examples. That means money to the internet application providers and to the service providers. Quality of service is what we engineers like to use, things like packet error rates and bit error rates, uh, outages, retrains in the system, data rates, what, what's the highest data rate I can get, um, signal to noise ratios, if you're familiar with that, receive signal strength indications. So these are great in terms of engineers designing system. We have very well defined quantities. We try to reduce them or improve them in some way, shape, or form. That's quality of service. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the consumer is actually happy with the service, even if those metrics are good. So quality of experience is what you'd really like uh, to achieve. So how might you do that with a cloud system? First off, you have to start collecting in your management system useful information. This will be the quality of service information, because that's really all the boxes have out there. And there are things like energy levels, signal to noise ratios, MCS stands for modulation encoding scheme that's actually used. Those are reportable parameters. Some of them are controllable through management interfaces if the device allows you to do that. You want to timestamp this data? Uh, how much energy? As I mentioned, the modulation parameters. Uh, indices for different uh, systems. I'll show a second system here. You start to collect all those things. And then you have certain policies that you may be able to impose. Now, how many of you actually know what the word, I used the word ergodic a minute ago. How many of you actually know what that is? You remember, you're a mathematician, you might have heard it before. I've only, get, I've only got one in the audience. Uh, two, sorry. Ergodic means when I take an average in time, if I'm measuring people and I'm trying to get the average height, if I measure it today, I get five foot 10. And if I measure it tomorrow, I get five foot 10. I measure it. So that's one average. That's a time average. Statistical averages that go around the room today, and I measure a bunch of people, and I get five foot 10 across that thing. When those two are equal, it's called ergodic. It means the statistical average is equal to the time average. So what we're going to be looking for is consistencies in the network. If you're seeing a problem every day at 5 o'clock, and this is very common in Wi-Fi, somebody comes home, turns on the Wi-Fi, starts doing whatever, email or whatever, the kids come home, do their homework or whatever, very consistent type of thing where you're going to see a pattern of bad uh, contention. You may see less contention at another point in time. So you're looking for those ergodicities in the cloud to start to say, OK, I know at that time I'm going to do something different than what was done previously, because that's not working. I'm going to try to learn that. OK, so these ESM, uh, the first stage uh, that proposed is the cocktail party problem, being polite with the amount of energy you use. This is the second stage, getting into mesh. Inside the home, we have multi little mesh points or mul multiple access points, and they're coordinated. But how would you coordinate them in a productive way? Third stage is starting to use, actually coordinate the systems and their antennas, their multiple antennas, to spatially carve up like they do in the, uh, in the, uh, in the cellular uh, world, and to try to do that from the cloud. Now, this is an example here. So it's a fairly simple example. But it has two users and two channels. Channels are A and B. And these, these numbers you see in the brackets are basically the gain on the path from the user to the receiver of that user. 
in the two channels, A and B. So I have some simple numbers here, 0 0.5, 0 0.9, and so forth, and I wrote the equations that describe that over on the right, but I think you get the basic idea here. There's crosstalk between these systems, okay? And so uh, what happens is um, when you look at a system like this, right uh, here, and you have, uh, you're looking at this first level solution with politeness, you see two of the users actually sharing one of the channels and one of the user getting the other channel. And if you look at CSMA, that's the Wi-Fi protocol today, it's called Carrier Sense Multiple Access, gets about 4.7 bits per second, if you like here, it's normalized to one second. And the, the cellular system, we get about 5.3, and the ESM system here will also get that 5.3. So it's a 13% gain. And this is if it's only lightly loaded at 10%. If that system is seeing, like we're at the conference, in many, many users, it's 50%. So the, uh, the, now you get the heavy case, the CMSA basically goes to zero. That's when you can't get Wi-Fi access, and you've all experienced that before. These other two techniques will still get the 5.3. Now you can take this a little bit further to the next uh, level of stage two. It's a little more po polite. It turns out to actually solve the problem optimally. It's an NP hard problem. You can't really get around there. There's a lot of different approximations to do that. Um, but you'll come up with some better numbers here. And you'll actually see these ergodic approaches starting to even do better than the cellular systems um, in this case. And gain for the 10% case is there. And of course, the, the infinite gain for the 50% uh, case remains. So what's actually going on here? Well, we're actually taking this data, and there's some machine learning, if you will, that's going on, some artificial intelligence inside the cloud. It's taking this data, it's using some logistic regression to actually try to compute something I like to call a log likelihood ratio. And basically what that means, if you get a plus three, the user's really happy. If you get a minus three, they're really unhappy. Zero, you're kind of in the middle on this. And you use that to kin continue to change the radio node until you get that, that better value, that desirable value of this log likelihood ratio, which you're computing from actual measured um, uh, data from the consumer that are gonna be things like the like or not like button, or the call rate, or other things. So, so my company's actually done this, and so I have some results here. First result is just on, is it accurate when you say the customer is not happy or not by doing this kind of thing, and then using it to manage Wi-Fi or Spectrum or other uh, uses of resource. We can see here the call rates, that's the phone there, and then the brown thing is the truck. Uh, that's a dispatch uh, to the, uh, the consumer's location to try to fix the problem. When we say it's bad, they're, they're calling, they're complaining. When we say it's good, that's, that's less. That's money to the service providers and the application providers. You can create a state machine, this is a big one here, but it's showing all the different settings that you're allowed to use in Wi-Fi. Columns are, are increasing one of the parameters, which is basically the constellation size, uh, sorry, the code rate, and, and then the, 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 the columns are the constellation size, the rows are the code rate, and in the lower left-hand corner is pretty bad, in the upper right-hand corner is pretty good, and what happens is you start measuring and you try moving around in that state machine, and you learn from that, and you try to get as far up to the right as you can, and that will improve the service and you're learning that from the statistics of the system. So I'm gonna skip this because we're running a little uh, tight on time here. But here's an example of an improvement in that quality of experience as measured basically by the call rates and the dispatches uh, across uses of these techniques in different parts of the world. And you can see that improvement's real. It's pretty large uh, by basically optimizing based on that, that feedback. Uh, here's maybe a little more tangible thing, which is Wi-Fi data rates. Um, the thing to look at is the low speeds. And you see without management, even with great access points, almost a quarter of the customers are getting below three megabits per second. Even if they advertise a gigabit per second, this is the contention problem. It's failing. Okay, and on the right-hand side, you can see that brown square going down significantly here, which means less contention. And then the last stage, I'm gonna skip a little bit, but it's here in the interest of time, but you get the idea that you can continue to do this if you can coordinate more from the cloud, you can take advantage of MIMO systems with multiple antennas and basically start carving up space on a statistical historical pattern. You say, this is happening at a certain time, stay out of that, that region of space, don't go in that angle over there, go in here. Instead, use it differently to avoid the contention. 
So uh, there are some standardization efforts uh, for this. Uh, there's a group called the Wi-Fi Alliance, which does a lot of the Wi-Fi standard. You heard 11A, B, C, uh, G, AX, and so forth. That comes from that particular group. And there's an effort underway uh, in there called the CMD, Cloud Management and Diagnostics Interface, that kind of sits as a common data model to get the right values to the cloud and allow the right return values from the cloud to be able to do more of these, these types of things. Uh, and it sits on top of a lot of other standards that if you're in this area you may have heard of, about the Broadband Forum, RDK Purple, WRT, and so forth, to try to enable this type of management to improve the Wi-Fi system to get around the mess. And here's just a couple of tables. These are some of the to the cloud, and these are some of the, sorry, uh, from the cloud to the device on the, on the, call those control parameters or policy parameters on the right that have been proposed for use in these, these standards efforts, which presumably will lead uh, to more uses. So in conclusion, this is a significant gain that's possible. Um, this ESM is a fundamental means for doing that. And the Y5, again, coming back to that community, do this through standards, and we do this, we're gonna see a better convergence and allow a lot of the, the uses, which may be going up uh, more so than we thought, with uh, the use of spectrum and more remote meetings and so forth that we all may be seeing in the future. So thank you. Are there any questions about 5G, Wi-Fi, or how they would work together? Yes, of course. Who are you? Where are you from? Your question, please. Um, my name is Ayush Hariharan, and I'm a high school senior from Northern Virginia. And one question I had is, by putting the cloud in between the users and the end goal, how does that affect like system performance like packet loss and other? Um, by putting what in the middle? Sorry, I didn't By putting like your cloud management service in the middle, how does that affect packet loss and reliability of the network? Well, the, the, the idea is it's, those are quality of service parameters. I made that point. Usually they go down when the quality of experience goes up. But to the, to the level where it's tuned to the, the consumer reaction, as opposed to the typical electrical engineering, if you go into that field and study this, we'd be looking at trying to make the packet lo loss rate less or to, to reduce the number of outages or so, doesn't necessarily mean the consumer is happy. You can get good measures on, on our electrically defined, very well defined measures and still see the customer's not happy with that service because there's something that we didn't consider from that perspective uh, in it. But generally they improve. Any other questions at this time? Yes. Who are you? Where are you from? Your question, please. Yeah, I'm Abhijit Rago, an undergrad from India. Uh, so uh, many of the improvements in 5G is particular to the millime millimeter wave spectrum, right? So, and it's a, it has small coverage and higher attenuation, so it may not be practical for the carriers to install millimeter wave towers every mile. So, but when you go to mid-spectrum, the performance is pretty much almost 4G. So when you uh, talk about the performance impact on for the, the general public, uh, how much will 5G actually impact them, the improvement? Well, you're is ab absolutely correct in characterizing the 5G. The millimeter wave is, is very small distances, and I know that there are some efforts. Uh, you know, Verizon has a big effort in the United States. It's not going very well uh, to try to use the millimeter wave band, um, and it, it's not as optimistic yet, at least. As, as they had hoped, so the mid bands are, are doing better. The three and a half gigahertz is one of the bands, and between five and six uh, gigahertz is another band that's of interest uh, recently for, uh, for 5G. Um, the smaller cell size there going through walls problem are clearly there. So all of those things are, are, are somewhat limiting in terms of the cost of infrastructure uh, to, to try to resolve them. Wi-Fi is out there. It's, it's already in all those places uh, that you really want to go to. Maybe a few places is still not, not present, but it is this mess, okay? And why to get out there is because it really empowered the consumers and everybody to be able to do what they wanted in, in the system as opposed to having this central group that would impose you know, on all the charges and fees and how you're going to do it and so forth. So I think it's a winner and it's an approach now that doesn't mean that it won't go to try to use millimeter wave also, because it will, um, and that the two are going to be uh, uh, competing even in the same frequency bands. Now that's going to be increasingly allowed. And so 
the cloud-based management, I think, is going to be the solution in the future that really allows the industry to, uh, to deal with exactly what you're describing. Yes, one more question. Um, uh, my name is Ankit. I'm also a high school senior um, from Northern Virginia. So um, my question is related to the reinforcement learning um, type of component that you described earlier. Mm -hmm. um, like you showed, like uh, I think you gave the example of like plus three of the users really happy, minus three of the users um, not very happy, and zero if th it's it's all right. right for them. So um, what are some other examples um, of types of learning methods that you've used aside from reinforcement learning? maybe Q learning or are there uh, any other ways that it hasn't to gone to the more advanced types of learning mm -hmm. I'd like to see that so yeah. that's a good question um, but the um, actually the other types of things I've seen are simpler where you you have you know a little bit of a human brain right. a little bit of a machine and so there's certain thresholds that instead of having a neural net learn that or, or you know some yeah. device in there the engineers looked at all the data and they figured out that's a pretty good threshold and they used it across that. So you see a combination of that. So that's really, it's nascent in terms of the use of, use of these techniques. Could it be better? Absolutely. One of the, the biggest uh, problems is, is kind of a fun, uh, uh, a fun example of this. Uh, a few years ago, it was, it was, it, my company was competing against a big company, Huawei. Everybody hears them of them. And they tried to do some of this and they went into a trial where they're competing with us. And they said, well, we're big. We've got to do this quickly, right? So they start 100,000 customers on the first day in the trial. And they got some of the thresholds in the training wrong. They took 10,000 out of service. Well, of course, they immediately stopped that because that's, that's a catastrophe for any internet service provider to lose that many customers. And they, they lost the bid. So it's, it's fraught with peril to not get it right. So you have to be very, very careful how you grow these things and learn and get better. Uh, with them so that you're not actually causing the complaint levels to go up because that, that'll kill the whole thing. So, uh, and it's, it's, it's easily possible to do that if you don't get it right. So that, that's actually the trick before we go to the very sophisticated methods is making sure that we're not, even, even something on a million users that only happens, you know, 0.01% of the time is 10,000 10, customers that are angry all at once. So you, you have to get those edge effects out of, of the training when you go forward. So it's a little cautious that way, but I believe it's ultimately possible uh, to do that. It just requires a care uh, in proceeding. Yeah. Any other questions at this time? Okay. Thanks so much. You're Kyo welcome. Kyofi.